So whenever we deal with our history, or they talk about black history and begin it here, they are erasing and ignoring all of this documented history, which is so vital to our development as human beings, as mothers and fathers. So this is what the process of being a memory recovery specialist entails. Doing the research, documenting the stories, and then making that information available to those with the need to know and having opportunities such as being here with you, Rock, to share this information with a larger audience so people can begin to learn what they never learned at school. And the takeaway from, from this interview today, this discussion today, is we should know that we can never rely on our former oppressors to educate us or our children. It's evident that he cares. What do you care about? Welcome to The Rock Newman Show. It's The Rock Newman Show. Greetings, my name is Rock Newman, and you are tuned in to another segment of the Rock Newman Show 2.0. I am uh, thrilled to be with you here today. When I started this journey several years ago, um, first of all, I started the journey right here where I am now physically at 1918 Martin Luther King Avenue, um, and uh, I am really thrilled about being back here at this location, given its address, Martin Luther King Avenue. I feel like it's special being here. We continue in every show in one form or the other to try to speak truth to power. Today, my guest, I've had him on before, and I will tell you, he is absolutely one of my favorite guests. Tony Browder, welcome, welcome to the Rock Newman Show. Thank you, Rock. It's okay. great to be back, brother. All right. Anthony Browder informed me during the first interview that he was a memory recovery specialist. And my um, very, very uh, intelligent mother, who had a sixth grade education, one of the smartest people I have ever met in my life, when she didn't understand what was being <laughs> said, she very ungrammatically ungramma incorrect would say, what do that mean? <laughs> and when he said memory recovery specialist, I ask him, bro, <laughs> what do that mean? Now, for the sake of you identifying with what we're going to do today and, and the Rock Newman Show 2.0, we're going to do something a little different today. Stay, 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 stay with me. So, Tony, so that the viewing audience understands, memory recovery specialist, would you please explain why you felt the need or why you feel the need to be a memory recovery specialist and what is it? Sure. Well, that term is a term that I created to describe the work that I've been doing for over 40 years. What I've come to understand over time, Rock, is that all we are are memories as human beings. All we are are memories. And the memories that, that we carry with us influence everything that we do throughout life. So what I discovered after college was that I had been miseducated. I had been given inaccurate memories about African people, 
African history, world history, and culture. And these inaccurate memories were guiding me through my life and limiting my capacity as a person of African ancestry to achieve success. It was only after I graduated from Howard, as a matter of fact, we're on uh, Martin Luther King uh, Boulevard in Southeast DC. Right around the corner from here was where I had my first transformation of consciousness when I attended a series of classes by Nana Kwabena Brown at the Temple of Inyame on African spirituality. Mm. He introduced me to African spirituality knowledge that had not been a part of my former educational process. And that seven week course put me on the path that I've been on for the last uh, 45 years. Wow. In 1977, I met Ivan Van Sertema, who had just written, They Came Before Columbus, The African Presence in America. He documented the fact that Africans from the Nile Valley built ships, uh, navigated the Nile River, the Mediterranean, the Atlantic Ocean, and came to the Americas via multiple visits at least 2,500 years before Christopher Columbus was born. And I want my, I want my <laughs> viewers to hear that well, because, you know, you rolled through this as the, <laughs> as the brilliant brother that it and learned brother that you are, but Ivan Van Sertema is uh, who he just mentioned. He wrote the book, They Came Before Columbus. Be aware of him, make sure your children are aware of him, introduce them to his work. Right, and it's, for context, that book was published in 1976. Van Sertema advanced the research of other scholars who had also written about the pre-Columbian African presence in America. He showed these Olmec heads that yes, are still yes. in existence yes. in Mexico yeah. and talked about how these Africans had influenced uh, the development of architecture, government, agriculture, mm -hmm. astronomy here in the Americas. Mm -hmm. And then he blew my mind when he said that they were Egyptians and Kushites and they were black. That was the first time, that's February 1977, yeah. was the first time in my life yeah. that anyone ever told me that the ancient Egyptians were black. I'm 26 years old, yeah. and I have been taught to believe in these lies that these ancient Africans were not African. Yeah. Right? That's when I became aware of what I referred to as forbidden knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I began reading the books of Van Sertema, John Henry Clark, yeah. A.C. Hillier, Dr. Ben, John Jackson, yeah. and it opened my mind to a new world. Yeah. And then I dedicated my life since then to researching as much as I could, to travel, to see the places where these scholars have written about, and then to come back home to D.C. and share that information with my local community and my national and international community. So a memory recovery specialist is what I call myself because it is my job to restore the memories that have been lost, stolen, and appropriated by others and help our people understand who we are. And with these correct memories in place, we can now determine how we're gonna move through the world today and how we can prepare our children to move into the world that we're going to create for them for tomorrow. Thank God for the work you do, brother. Brother, thank, thank God, God for you, man. Thank God for the work you do. Um, we have this timeline, this historical timeline over our backdrop here today for a specific reason. <clears throat> At my age, I attempt not to be angry all the time, but it's hard. And it makes me think back to, I heard you say, you learned that you had been miseducated. And, you know, I don't know, some time ago I started to question and to be extraordinarily disappointed, Tony, in the education that I received uh, primarily through uh, elementary school, junior high school, and high school. And college, uh, and college. And, and, and college, mm -hmm. even, though, even though it was at Howard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So, what do I mean? What I mean is, look, at 12 years or so old, I read uh, Man, Child, and the Promised Land. Mm -hmm. I read the autobiography of uh, Malcolm X, and I became a disciple, a fanatical admirer of Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. So that in itself gave me a sense of consciousness. Sure. 
which a lot of people in my community, some of the ball players and that I played with, you know, thought I was off into some weird stuff, you know, talking about black power and the, the Black Panthers. I think at 14 or 15, I snuck off to a, a, a secret Black Panther meeting, uh, me and another brother from, from, from my high school. So a certain, I had a certain level of consciousness. When I got to the 11th grade in my high school at Prince George's County, Maryland, there was something, we saw something that said, you want to have a, you, though you could sign up to go to a black history class. And I was like, wow, really? Okay. So I'm, man, I tried to be first on the list. And we, I think, went to another high school or maybe the junior college and some of the other schools sent some uh, students. So maybe there were 20 of us mm -hmm. from the whole county that was studying, black, this, looking at this new black history. And I think it was once a month. I think they did it once a month for two hours. Mm -hmm. I heard there for the very first time about something that's going to be covered, and that is, I heard about the Kush mm -hmm. people, and I heard about the Moors. I don't remember much more from the classes, but, you know, that stands out. Just hearing about them informed me how I had been miseducated. And how, and I, be, I was so disappointed in the miseducation. And for myself, and then looking at a system that would intentionally put together a curriculum that would continue to deny us who we were. So when you see this up here today, it's a historical timeline. And we're going to take all the time that Tony Browder needs to walk through this timeline. Starting basically 5,000 years. Tony, I'm going to invite you to sure. do this here now. Or <coughs> I don't know if you want to uh, do an introduction of what you're doing or just doing it. From the board. <clears throat> okay. Well, let me do an introduction, general yeah. introduction. And I want to say this, Rock, you and I are about the same age. Yes. So we came of age during the 60s. Yeah. Uh, which I feel was the most important decade in the history of humanity. Okay. Consciousness that's a, that's was That's a big trans. statement, but go it's ahead. A big yeah. statement, yeah. but if you look at what happened in the 60s, mm -hmm. um, Malcolm X, I was, 14, I was 14 when Malcolm was killed. Yeah. I was 17 when uh, Martin was killed. Yeah. I was uh, 19 when Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were oh. killed. I grew up in Chicago. Oh, so I remember all of these, these deaths impacting yeah. my life. And I remember how black folks stood up, the black consciousness movement, the black power, power movement was in the 60s, late, late 1960s, and it transformed my consciousness as well. Unfortunately, I didn't learn anything about black history until after I graduated from college. Yeah. And there's no mistake that we're having this conversation in Washington, D.C., which was the home of Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who established Negro History Week yeah. in my hometown of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And that was expanded to Black History Month right. in 1977 by John Henry Clark and other scholars. But um, the book, The Miseducation of the Negro, written by Carter G. Woodson 90 years ago this year, speaks to the fact, speaks to the power of miseducation mm -hmm. and the power of restoring your memory. Why? Because he said if you control a person's thinking, that is their memory, you don't have to worry about their actions. Yeah. So if you were given false memories, if we're miseducated, it means that nothing we do will succeed. Why? Because we've got inaccurate information driving us yes. backwards. Yes. You're moonwalking backwards through life. Yes. And so it is through the accurate 
and through the process of the restoration of our memories so that we can, we can begin to access those accurate memories which are still there mm -hmm. and bring them to the forefront of our consciousness, that changes everything. So that's what this whole thing is about. Yeah. So from my standpoint, as a 72-year-old African-American male who survived some of the worst that America had to offer, I understand the value of re-educating myself and not getting angry. Mm -hmm. See, because when you get angry, it locks you in a mode where you can't access those memories. Yeah. See, here's the point that I'm making, and then I'll talk about the timeline. What I know, and I only talk about what I know, not mm -hmm. what I think, mm -hmm. not what I believe, what can be proven by substantial facts. As a matter of fact, it was Ivan Van Cernema who often told us, never say anything in public that you can't document with at least four sources. So mm -hmm. I talk about what I know and what can be proven. Mm -hmm. So what I know is that humanity began in Africa at least 300 thousand years ago. That's a scientifically proven fact. What we know is that uh, Africans living in East Africa, the first human beings on the planet, began walking out of Africa into Asia around 60,000 years ago. Okay. And then around 40,000 uh, years ago, another group of Africans began walking into Western Asia, the landmass that is now known as Europe. Mm -hmm. So what that means is the first people in Asia were African. Yeah. The first people in Europe were Africans. Uh -huh. And ultimately, those people migrated all around the world, populating the entire planet. So mm -hmm. geneticists has, have proven that there is no such thing as race. Race was a false construct oh, right. created by racists. There's right. only one race, the human race, which right. had its origins in Africa. Mm -hmm. So everybody on this planet is of African descent, whether they're willing to acknowledge it or not. Mm -hmm. That's point one. Point two, not only do Africans have the oldest genetic memories of anybody going back 300,000 years, the other important part of this conversation, Rock, is that geneticists have recently identified when the African genes in Europe mutated and they lost their melanin and became white, i.e. Caucasians. Mm. And those genes have mutated somewhere between um, 5,000 and 4,000 years ago. Hmm. That's the historical reality. So white folk have only been on this planet four to 5,000 years. So get this. If we, people of African descent, have been on this planet for 300,000 years, we carry in our DNA the memories of all of those ancestors, which means that we have a 295,000 year head start on the memories of those people classified as Caucasian. So those are the memories that I'm interested in accessing and restoring because we have the capacity to do that. We've always had the capacity to do that. And those within our community specifically, who we classify as geniuses, the Stevie Wonders, the Muhammad Ali's, the Malcolm X's, uh, the um, Francis Crest Wilson, those are individuals who have been able to tap into their ancestral memory mm -hmm. and allow those voices to speak through them. That's why they stood out from the crowd. That's the capacity that every human being has. And part of my work as a memory recovery specialist is to help people feel comfortable about themselves so that these memories that they carry with them can come forth into their consciousness in such a way that they're not angry. They become um, uh, reinculturated. Mm -hmm. And that then opens the door for a whole new reality. So let me, let me just say this by, uh, you know, for, for fur further reference, if there's anybody out there that is not aware of Anthony Browder. You've been to, you've led uh, trips, uh, excursions to mm -hmm. digs and much more to Egypt. Mm -hmm. How many times now? Well, I've been doing excavations in Egypt for the past 15 years. I've been leading study tours to Egypt uh, since 1987, and I've been traveling to Egypt since 1980. So I've, I have made uh, 66 trips to Egypt in the last 43 years. So I understand the culture, I understand the civilization, and we have done what no other black people in the history of the planet have done, and that is finance an archeological excavation on the West Bank of Luxor, Egypt, an excavation of 25th dynasty tombs, Kushite tombs. Yes. And what we have been able to prove is that there's a direct correlation between the Kushites of the 25th dynasty, approximately 750 BC, 
and the Kemites of the first dynasties who preceded them by 2,000 years. There's a direct correlation, and the Kushites acknowledge that they were the same people. So one of the things that we're dealing with now is the falsification of African history and the erasure of African memory with other people saying that the ancient Egyptians were not black or is a multicultural uh, civilization. I'll show you on the timeline the truth of that mm -hmm. and the falseness of that statement. So if I can, can I get, go to get, the timeline? Let me do one more thing. Let, sure. me, let, me, let, me, let me humanize this <laughs> and personalize this because I remember it seems like a year, maybe two years ago, <laughs> um, seeing your daughter mm. in one of the tombs. Yes. And for someone who has been so passionate about this for so long, to see your offspring embracing this as she did, how did that make you? How did that make Daddy Tony Bradley feel? Well, that event happened 13 years ago. 13 right? years. 13 My years goodness. ago. And, and, and let me kind of give you the context. Yeah. Uh, Tony Browder was born in Chicago in 1951 to a teenage mother. My mother was 16 when I was born. Okay. She married my father, Harold Browder, when I was five, divorced him when I was 10. And uh, when I was 46 years old, I found out that Harold Browder was not my biological father. Oh, boy. All right. So my mother and father's uh, divorcing and, and the, my father not being in my life left a void in my heart. Mm -hmm. And so when um, Atlantis's mother and I divorced, I got sole custody of my daughter. Mm -hmm. and my primary reason was because I didn't want my daughter to grow up not knowing her father True. like I grew up not knowing my father. Yeah. So I have immersed her in this history and culture, and this is all she knows. Yeah. She would come to the lectures with Asa Hilliard and Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark and Francis Wells, and she uh -huh. knew them, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. so they had dinner at our house. Yeah. So she's been embracing this. And we've written books together. I took her to Egypt when she was seven years old. We wrote and published her first book when she was eight. She was the youngest published author in America at that time hmm. in uh, 1991. And we have traveled the world together, written several books together. She will be um, 42 in uh, 10 days, 41 in 10 days. Okay. And so we made this journey together. We are the first father-daughter archaeological um, team members in history. So it was an honor for me to take her to Egypt during our excavation when we found 70 feet underground the burial chamber of this Kushite noble person by the name of Karaka Men. And that photograph that you're talking about was taken in August of 2010. The two of us spent a week together excavating in this tomb. Mm, mm, 70 mm. feet underground, just the two of us having serious daddy-daughter time. Mm, mm, and she mm. asked me, you know, Dad, how is it that you and I happen to be here at this moment doing this work? And I said, baby, obviously this is something that we were destined to do. We're doing it together. And I'm at the point in my life where I'm preparing to transition from this work into other work, and I'm leaving the uh, IKG to my daughter and other yeah. colleagues and other young folk that yeah. I've worked with yeah. over the past decade or so to move my work and this progress into the next generation. So I'm, I'm happier than, than you can ever imagine. I go, man. I, I know you must be, man. Yes, sir. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank Congratulations. You. So, folks, we're going to school. We're on the Rock Newman Show 2.0. Look, call your friends. Call your family. Call your mama. Call your daddy. Call your children. You need to see this. You need to see this because we're going to school and it's very, very important for who you are and who you can become. Take a look. And the brother, help yourself. Take your time. Well, here's the timeline. And this was a product that a colleague of mine in the UK by the name of Paul Abena uh, developed. He was a high school teacher. And he found that his students, like most high school students, weren't interested in history. So over a period of several years, I worked with him in developing this timeline, which shows you the correct chronology of human history. Mm -hmm. And this is a short version of the timeline, timeline that begins at 5000 B.C. And we have documented here things that were developed in Africa by African people before there was history and culture anywhere else uh, in the world. Uh, we make reference to Naphtaplia, which was 
built uh, down near the border of Egypt and Kush. It is the oldest astro-archaeological calendar in existence. It is it was constructed about 7,000 BC, 3,500 years before Stonehenge. And accurate physical evidence which demonstrates that our people in Africa had knowledge of the stars and identified specific stars that would be important to the history and development of Kemet and Kush. As we move down the timeline, we see other developments of African history and culture. And then we begin to first focus our attention on dynastic Kemet. Kemet is the original name for the country that the Greeks later renamed Egypt. Kemet means the nation, the land of the black people, and not the black land of the black soil, as some people would want to tell you. So these people were clear about who they were. We have images of the personalities associated with the founding of dynastic Kemet, the first documented government in the history of mankind. And as we move down the timeline, we see images of kings, royal personalities, who lived, who ruled, and the accomplishments associated with them. The first significant structure here is the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, designed by Imhotep, the African, the world's first multi-genius. He constructed a 19-story skyscraper around 2600 BC, a building that is still standing today. That represents African architecture, engineering, astronomical development, is all incorporated in this structure. And then... Tony, if you, before you go, I, I just want to reinforce something. If you don't know about Imhotep, mm. Google it, do whatever is necessary for you and yours, those that you love, to become familiar with Imhotep. I'll give you one small example. Um, uh, uh, the Hippocratic Oath mm -hmm. is what medicine throughout the world goes by, what people take to. That's supposed to be the standard. It was by Hippocrates. Hippocrates, mm -hmm. Hippocrates wrote that the, he got it from Imhotep. He called Imhotep, what did he call him? Asclepius, uh, the yeah, god of medicine. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. He called Imhotep. He said he didn't deserve. It was Imhotep mm -hmm. who taught him. He sat at the foot of Imhotep's knowledge. Right, absolutely. And so in that context, Rock, the Greeks came into Kemet, renamed it Egypt, studied 4,000 years of African excellence, and then attempted to replicate it the best they could. And so the Greeks then went on to become the fathers of medicine, yeah. the fathers of philosophy. But they acknowledged, the Greeks acknowledged that we got all of this from the Africans in Kemet. So gotcha. those are memories that have to be restored as gotcha. well. Gotcha. So Imhotep, and as a matter of fact, a great book on Imhotep is called Imhotep the African, written by Robert Baval and Thomas Brophy, Imhotep the African. So we have the Great Pyramids of Giza, which from the time of their construction, around 2500 BC until 1888, when the Washington Monument was built, this was the tallest man-made object on the planet. African excellence on display. We move down the timeline and we can see images of African rulers. Even though some of the noses may be missing, some of the lips may be missing, you can still tell you're looking at the faces of African people. As we continue down the timeline, we have examples of the Edwin Smith Papyrus, which is the oldest medical text ever recorded, which we know that it was a copy of an earlier ancient African medical text. So again, reinforcing uh, the significance of Imhotep as the true father of medicine. And then we have other kings as we move down the timeline. Uh, we have here is uh, the reference, the main reference that I want to make here is 832 B.C. 832 B.C. is when Homer wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. That is the earliest example of writing in Europe, which existed thousands of years after documented examples of African writing. Every temple in Kemet had a library. Every library had thousands of books, papyrus scrolls, on knowledge associated with every aspect of the human endeavor. So the Europeans began writing at 832 BC. And then we have at 776, Romulus and Remus founded the city of Rome. So right here in this little area, we have the beginning of Greco-Roman civilization, which is where European history begins. So they began our history here, eliminating 
all of this or appropriating much of this as their own creation. As we continue to move down the timeline, we also see here references of the 25th dynasty, Africans from Kush who ruled Kemet for about uh, 100 years. And unfortunately, many Egyptologists and historians refer to the 25th dynasty as the Negro dynasty, which implies that the other dynasties or rulers in Kemet were not African. That's not true. Those are memories that need to be erased and restored with accurate memories. So it just so happens that the tombs that we are restoring were tombs that were built during the 25th dynasty, tombs associated with some of the most significant uh, rulers in the history of the world. And the primary tomb is of a priest by the name of Karakamen, who based on our evidence, we believe very strongly that he was likely the son of Shabaka, the third king of the 25th dynasty. As we move down the timeline, we come into a period where the Greeks began to come into Egypt let me, to study let me, uh, in let Egypt. Me, let me slide over so you okay. can get a better shot. We come down the timeline. We reach the period here where the Greeks began coming into Egypt or Kemet to study philosophy, mathematics, medicine, and they then return home and will later become the fathers of those things that were said to have been attributed to them. And then we have the period here, 332 is when Alexander of Macedonia conquered Kemet. And then the name Kemet was renamed to Egypt. Egypt is a word that describes the name of one temple in the uh, lower part of the country. And that name was given to the entire country. So Egypt is a Greek word. Pyramid is a Greek word. Sphinx is a Greek word. So if we don't know the original names of African people, places, and things, we don't know Jack. It's about restoring those memories. And so uh, the Romans took over Egypt in 30 BC and ruled Egypt for approximately 300 years. So when you see people talk about the Egyptians as being white, they're really talking about Egypt under the rulership of Europeans during this time frame from 332 until about um, uh, 350 um, AD. And then other invaders came in and ultimately took control of all the land. But the important point that I want to leave, you, you mentioned uh, the Moors. So here we have presence images here of the Moors invasion of Spain in 711, bringing history and culture and science and philosophy and astronomy into Europe, taking Europeans out of the caves, so to speak. They ruled uh, from 711 to 1492 in Spain before they were driven out. And then we have the rise of, of various empires and kingdoms in West Africa. The important thing that I want us to focus our attention on is this little period here in blue, which is the period of the European enslavement of African people. It runs from 1444 until 1888. When people talk about black history or Negro history, they lock us in this time frame. When they enslaved our ancestors, killed tens of millions of men, women, and children in order to create the wealthiest power systems that the world has ever known, and the United States is the end product of that. So whenever we deal with our history, or they talk about black history and begin it here, they are erasing and ignoring all of this documented history, which is so vital to our development as human beings, as mothers and fathers. So this is what the process of being a memory recovery specialist entails. Doing the research, documenting the stories, and then making that information available to those with the need to know and having opportunities such as being here with you, Rock, to share this information with a larger audience so people can begin to learn what they never learned at school. And the takeaway from, from this interview today, this discussion today, is we should know that we can never rely on our former oppressors to educate us or our children. Look at what's happening in Florida, in Virginia, in Texas, and all around the country. White folk are afraid to teach the truth about what their ancestors have done to us and done to others around the world. So it is our responsibility to do what our ancestors did hundreds of years ago, and that is to teach us what they know. So we should make our, our homes our first 
um, schools, yes. the first libraries. Yeah. Uh, we should make our barbershops, our beauty shops, our, our, our Masonic lodges, our fraternities and sororities, and our churches, sacred spaces where we can have these conversations with our children and the adults in the community on a regular basis. That's how we change the, the, the uh, dynamic and the circumstances that we currently find ourselves in. Whew. If I was the king of the whole wide world, I'd clone you. <laughs> uh, I'd clone you times 1,000, man. Well, my middle name is Tyrone, so you can clone yeah, Tyrone. Tyrone the clone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for that. I suspect that as conscious of a community as I have that watches the Rock Newman Show 2.0, I wouldn't have any doubt that this is some information that that is new. Um, I will I will say once again, the older I have gotten, the more that I have learned, the more I understand the intentionality of um, of the power structure, the intentionality for us not to know ourselves. Exactly. That, I mean, it is just, it fits like a glove with their somewhat diabolical need for us never to understand who we are mm -hmm. and you see it so afoot today right now today with the banning of books and the issues so-called issues with critical race theories and you know you know it it just it stands logic on its head hmm. when one talks about well, I don't want my little Susie to feel badly. So you want to lie to her. You want to lie. You don't want to, you don't want to tell her the truth of this, of this country. And really, as Tony has just pointed out, of the world. Mm -hmm. So your statement about it should start in the home. And look, you know, Malcolm and many others have said for so long, you know, Allowing the oppressor hmm. to teach your children is suicide. Absolutely. So, folks, we here on this show want to encourage you as individuals to become a community, to spread the kind of knowledge, to spread the kind of news that you are, are getting here today. And I'm going to make a, I'm going to make an appeal. And that is to go to Tony Browder's social media platforms. Tony, how can people reach you, best reach you? The best place to reach us is at our website, www.ikg-info.com. .ikg.info. No, dash info. Oh, oh com. let me say it again. ikg-info.com. Uh -huh. It's where people can find information about the timeline. They can purchase the timeline. They can purchase our books. Uh, they can participate in our study tours to Egypt. They can participate in our Egypt on the Potomac field trip of Washington, D.C. And we've got some new programs that we're implementing. Um, we have a program, um, and it was interesting as you were talking about your high school and, and going to this class where you were going to be taught black history. For eight years, I would go to San Jose, California. I flew out to San Jose, California to have this sort of discussion with African-American students in three different high schools. I taught them what they weren't learning in school and transformed their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're nationalizing that program. It's called CIP, the Cultural Imperative Program. And my daughter and I have already developed the curriculum using my first book from the Browder file where we're teaching uh, we're showing people how to read the essays in the book, write reflection papers, and have discussions so that we can 
help to guide their transformation of consciousness and the restoration of, of memory. And we've, I've got a colleague who teaches at Howard, Brother um, Qualey, who did his PhD dissertation on our work. He did the longitudinal study mm -hmm. in order to show how immersing African-American teenagers in the recovery of their historical memory corresponded to an improvement in their test scores, Come on. improvement in their behavior in school and at home. So we know this works. Mm -hmm. Deep inside of every person, Rock, mm -hmm. is a desire to want to know the truth. Yeah. And as I stated earlier, I found out when I was 46 that Harold Browder, the man that my mother married in divorce, was not my biological father. So mm -hmm. I spent the past 27 years searching for my biological father, mm -hmm. and I just found him five months ago. Oh, man, congratulations. I just found my father. He's 91 years old, uh. Uh, and I found out that, um, that I'm no longer an only child. Uh -huh. I'm the eldest of seven children. Oh, boy. I got six siblings, man. Come on, man. So, so when you search for the truth, yeah and find the truth, it is mentally liberating, mm -hmm. it is spiritually liberating, because mm -hmm. what I know, what I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, is that the ancestors are real. The last time I was on your show was six years ago, as we came together to commemorate the life and the legacy of Dr. Francis Chris Welsing. Yes. You know, Dr. Welsing was, was near and dear to my heart, and uh, Dr. Welsing passed just uh, two and a half months before my mother passed. Yeah. And so being more acquainted with death, the older we are, the mm -hmm. more sure. people around us die. Sure. What I've learned from 14 years of excavating in this tomb is that these ancestors, our ancestors in Kush and Kemet understood that there is no death. They understood that we come back. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we must do to ensure our coming back is to leave guidance for those who are here yeah. to remember us, to pour libation, yeah. to call our names, to name yeah. things after us, yeah. streets yeah. and institutions. Because when you name something after an ancestor and you speak their name, you're giving power and life. They live in your mind, mm -hmm. they live in your heart, and you now have the capacity to replicate what they did. Mm -hmm. That's the power of memory restoration, and that's what our lives need to be about. Tony, I'm gonna, I could end right there. I, <laughs> I, 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 I could, but I, I want to do something. I, I would like my viewers who haven't seen you before, and maybe those who have, to understand something. So we're doing this show in Washington, D.C., Martin Luther King Boulevard, Southeast Washington, D.C., this outside of town, if you will. Mm -hmm. You do, you, 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 did, you had a program in uh, Egypt on the Potomac. Mm -hmm. If you wouldn't mind, would you give a snapshot? Now, I, I, I want to encourage and urge all of you around this country to find out about Egypt on the Potomac. If you can give us a bit of a tour of Egypt, Egypt on the Potomac and some of the symbolism that exists right here in the nation's capital, that people, you know, <clears throat> Yankee Doodle Dandy be <laughs> snotting and crying with their patriotism. And where did it come from? You tell them. Great. So uh, I think, Rock, this is my sixth or seventh show that I've done with you. And we did a two-part show on Egypt on the Potomac. So folk can go online and pull up that show to get more detail. But uh, Egypt on the Potomac... <clears throat> Uh, the idea of Egypt on the Potomac came to me in 1985 after I returned from my second trip to Egypt. And as I walked throughout D.C., which has been my home for the past 52 years, I started having flashbacks of Egypt. I started seeing objects in D.C. that reminded me of similar objects that I had seen in Egypt. And because of my background in design and architecture, I knew that that wasn't an accident. The Washington Monument being one of the most visible examples. The, the object that stands in the geographical center of the city, the object which uh, Congress has mandated that no building could be taller than the Washington Monument. Uh, no building can obstruct its view. That structure, which they call an obelisk, which is a Greek word, is actually a tekken, which is an ancient Kemetic word, and it, it is the oldest symbol of resurrection known to mankind. 
It represents the resurrection of the African king, the founder of Kemet, known as Asar, who's better known by his Greek name, Osiris, the first person in recorded history who died and was resurrected. He was the prototype for the person 4,000 years later of Jesus. So that symbol stands in the geographical center of Washington, D.C., and it stands on 16th Street, which is the Washington Meridian. The White House is located at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. A meridian is a corridor of spiritual energy. 16th Street runs um, seven miles from St. John's Church in front of the White House mm -hmm. to its termination point at Eastern Avenue. And on the seven miles of 16th Street, you have over 55 churches, two Masonic temples, and other spiritual centers. More spiritual centers on the seven-mile stretch of land than any other seven-mile stretch of land in the United States of America. So 16th Street is also known as God's Boulevard because of all the churches. It's called the Avenue of the Churches. But Masons refer to 16th Street as a corridor of light, light being a representation of knowledge and power. On 16th Street, you have Meridian Hill Park. In Meridian Hill Park, you have representations of the comedic symbol of life, the Ankh, in the reflection pool. You have in the, um, in the uh, reflection pool at the end of the steps, the 13 steps. Every year, the U.S. Park Service plants two plants in that reflection pool, the papyrus plant and the lotus plant. Those were the symbols that were carved on the throne of the kings of Kemet. Y'all know y'all want a part of this. Yes. Come on. Come so on. So all of this information is laid out, and, and then we end it on Capitol Hill at the Library of Congress, the greatest repository of history, culture, and knowledge in the world. And I talk about the 33 heads which surround the Thomas Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress. And I show on that field trip how when that building was constructed in the late um, um, 19th century, eight, 19th century, that the people who constructed that building knew exactly the information that I'm sharing with you right now. They knew that Africans were the first human beings on the planet. They knew that everybody else is speciated from these Africans, and they literally hid that information in plain sight. So the essence, the theme of our Egypt on the Potomac field trip is secrets hidden in plain sight. And the idea is we live in, this, in the capital of the world. Uh, a city filled with secret agencies, FBI, the CIA, the NSA. This is the capital of secrets. But think about this concept. What better way to hide a secret than to hide it in the open where everybody can see it? All you need to do is to erase people's memory mm -hmm. so they don't understand what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. And so our field trip, your show, is an opportunity to help restore people's memory such that with those restored memories, they now have the freedom to become who they were supposed to be all the time. Tony Browder, thank you, man. I'm glad I asked you that question. Thank and you, I'm brother. glad you joined us today. God Appreciate bless you. Appreciate you. Bless you, my man. Folks, that's going to wrap us up for today. Much love to you and yours. We'll see you the next time. It's a wrap.